All right, so why don't you love me back open source? <laughs> so when I was writing this, uh, it was easy to write the title, <clears throat> but then as I was putting together these slides, I've asked myself multiple times why in the world I took this perspective and approach to the problem. But in the end, I managed to put it together. So let's see how it came together. So a couple of words about me and Linaro. Uh, I think you guys all know Linaro. I think it's uh, good to put things in perspective. Linaro was funded back in 2010. Uh, with the, uh, well, at that time, if you guys remember, ARM was trying to establish footprints in open source, kernel bootloader, tool chains, and such. And then each ARM licensee and silicon vendor, they were just going to the community and mainline projects with their own set of patches, which were conflicting one with each other. So Linaro was created and invented to kind of, you know, standardize and put an end to fragmentation of contributions. And so originally the mission and the charter was about collaborative engineering uh, for the ARM open source ecosystem. And then over time, Linaro added a developer services component, which is the part of Linaro uh, that has open source expertise that works with device makers uh, to build real products. So while Linaro original charter was all about collaborative engineering, uh, developer services is all about proliferation of open sourcing products. So we enable the ecosystem and we push products uh, that use open source that we build in the ecosystem. That's kind of the powwow and how we do that. And I'm a uh, director at developer services at Linaro. My name is Davide. And I think 80% of you know me already. So um, while I was doing this talk, I was researching the uh, seven stages, stages of every relationship. And if you believe it or believe it or not, it, this does apply to engineers as well. And more importantly, it does apply to hardware engineers as well, which is strange. We're all software engineer. We know hardware engineer don't feel, you know, as we do, but this applies to them as well. And uh, it's also funny enough that you can put those phases, those stages on the hype curve, which we've seen for other reasons and in other use cases, right? So the first of the seven stages being that of infatuation, the second being that of dating, the third stage is that of struggle, the fourth is that of disillu disillu disillusionment, the fifth being that of stability, commitment, and bliss. Yes, I, and many stops, many stop right there, right? It's not many go for, you know, beyond this disillusionment phase, but if you can manage to, you can find stability, commitment, and bliss, right? Which is another way to say I ignore the pain and, you know, I'm bliss for that. And if you were wondering, yes, this doesn't look pretty because I did draw this myself. So, infatuation, that first look, right? At a friend's pizza and hacking party, or the Linux Foundation or Linaro Connect conference, or at an operating systems principles class, right? You get to see it, you get to see open source, you get to hear about that, you get to play a little with it, right? But that's enough, that's the initial sparkle, right? This sparks curiosity. Right? Open source is built beautifully for this. So you just check open source out online. You see if you share the same interest with the open source projects that are out there. You want to see if you share the same passions. And I'm just using Zephyr and Yalta project as two examples, right? Right, so based on what you see, now you are encouraged, right, from this first feedback. Uh, documentation is readily available to you, right? And yes, these projects have a quite complicated website, which is a good sign because they're open source projects. Websites don't matter. Documentation does, right? Uh, there's a vast library of manuals and targeting different personas, like what is the author project without the BSP developers manual, right? Right, who cares about the user manual? I'm a BSP developer. If the BSP developer manual and guide is lacking, then I'm not even trying the project. Uh, there's a well documentation on functionalities. There's broad hardware support, although it wasn't the case 10 years ago or 15 years ago. Uh, there's a predictable release cadence and versioning. Uh, 
there's a compatibility program, right? That states whether or not what you do can be compatible with the projects that you want to leverage. And there are community channels and mailing lists. And there's no signs of RTFMs left. Those have been just wiped out clear. And there's industry backing. So this kind of ends the first phase from the first look to feeling encouraged that you want to move forward. So you do move forward, right? So you get going. I'm going to be using this get going a lot, right? To the point that it would be annoying, but I just use it here. And so I'm going to keep doing that, right? So you just clone the Yalta project repo and off you go to the dating phase. Okay. The first date is always virtual. Right? In real life, we use Zoom during COVID pandemic, right? or Google Meet uh, in the Zephyr or Yalta project world, or in general, us embedded software developers, we use QMU instead of Zoom. We like that better. Uh, there is a good selection of user space bundles, um, which Yalta calls targets. You can build from a minimal uh, uh, user space to a fully featured user space that boots into graphical mode. And then you can run the operating system directly on your host machine uh, running QMU. And it's cross architecture. So you can try ARM, Intel, even PowerPC, even MIPS, if that's still a thing. Do we still have MIPS in Yalta Project? I don't remember. Huh. I can't remember either. Nobody uses MIPS anymore. Do we still have Broadcom MIPS routers out there? We had the Malta 4K at some point, remember? At any rate, yes. So you can try these instructions. Uh, I went by memory on the plane. Uh, they should be working. And the disclaimer is there because I know that each and every one of you will take the slides and try them and try to you know, see if I was right or wrong. So feel free to try them. And then especially the echo command that reminds you that that could not work. So that's the first date. The second uh, date is physical. And uh, this is the RB5 from Qualcomm. It's a robotic high-end platform uh, with AI and vision. And it's supported by Meta Qualcomm, which is a layer that Qualcomm and Linaro maintains uh, jointly, uh, hosted at yachtoproject.org, Git repo. Um, so this is the set of instructions. And so again, the second part of the date is physical. You clone the meta Qualcomm layer and you add the layer with the bitbake layer command and you change the machine to Qualcomm RMV8 and you build a core image, uh, which is minimal, right? And this all goes smoothly. Right? So even the second date uh, works well. And the third, uh, stage of the dating comes around. This is where you take open source to your friends, right? You've done virtual, you've done physical, and now it's you introduce to friends and family. Uh, you're bullish uh, thanks to the progress uh, that you've done real fast. You share the results, damn you, with coworkers and manager. A commitment is coming right there. And you talk about this with family and share your excitement. And then you stand firmly behind the proposal of using it in production. This is all based on infatuations and dating, right? So it's, it's fairly quick, right? Probably you are a couple of weeks into it and you are already ready to take it in production. All right. Which is where the struggle comes. Because when you want to be serious, <laughs> it's about schedule requirements and expectations, just like in real life, right? So first of all, time pressure. Because now that you stand firmly behind the decision of taking open source into production, uh, product launch date is set. So the time is uh, ticking. Uh, there's always limitations. There's always less hardware than we need. Right? We always need more. And that's why QMU was invent invented in first place. But you still need real hardware. And uh, there's issues with availability, right? You have to work on boot time and usability requirements because this product has to be available most of the times. And it has to be responsive, uh, real-time response, video encoding and decoding, frame rate, video resolution. These are all things that you didn't have to care about 
uh, before moving into the production phase. Uh, there aren't constraints, just like in life, memory and storage. Our memory gets worse over time, right? That of physical hardware target is constrained by definitions because, you know, you can save money when you uh, ship millions of devices out there, right? One gigabyte saves money. And then there's people's demand, those application developers. They want the libraries, they want their SDKs, they want a lot of questions and how-tos, right? All of this is part of schedules, requirements, and expectations. That's the first part of the struggle, right? And this looks like you, right? Thinking maybe that was a smart choice. <laughs> maybe I should have waited a couple of weeks more before committing myself to productions. But no, who cares? You will power through. Round one, target QMU. Right? And for most of you, this is no, right? So bear with me in the analogy. <laughs> uh, so you branch off and you fork off and, and you just tell yourself that that's for some days, right? I'm gonna merge back soon enough. And you pull additional drivers, packages and libraries because you know, the auto project, it doesn't support the world. There's, al there's always something outside of the auto project domain that you need. So those darn application developers need and they ask you. Uh, you train the package manifest and you remove the unnecessary software. Uh, there's two approaches here. You can start from the image which is minimal and add things on top, or you can start from the image that contains most of the things you need and just work your way down, right? So if you're in a hurry, the second approach is what most of the people choose. Although the former approach would be better because you're more control of what gets into the file system of your target. So you start patching configuration files and code, you package it up in a separate layer, you export the SDK, the US image for the application developers, and you're good. So now the hardware comes, right? And it's a second round. So you try to rebase, right? Say that maybe four weeks have gone by. So you try to rebase everything. Remember you branched, you wanna rebase and realign. And at this point, you might well succeed uh, with the author project releases, right? If there's a new one that became available in the meantime, and you do the same for all of the additional drivers and packages and libraries that you've collected uh, upstream, right? You have to rebase to the latest because it'd be silly not to do this otherwise. Uh, at this point of the project, uh, you start adding off tree patches, things that didn't make sense to add in the QMU world. Now it does make sense to do so such as preempt RT patches, for instance, and you start measuring things. Uh, this is the real world. So you measure boot time, memory usage, you start me uh, measuring storage, uh, contest switch time, system responsiveness. Uh, you delay a bunch of services because you don't like how the system boots up and you start pushing things uh, to later because you want to get to the prompt as soon as possible, right? It's so back to responsiveness requirements. Uh, you start moving to modules, some of the uh, functionalities that were built into kernel, right? Again, this is to speed up the boot process and you start changing process priorities or nice, right? To make sure that the services that you care for boot first uh, or take the necessary priority and they respond in time. Uh, you start running intensive benchmarking uh, and again, as you do all this, you're gonna start patching configuration files and code, package all back up in the layer that you just created. You update the SDK, the OS image, and you give it to the application developers. Okay, and that's the second part through struggle stage. And then round three, this is integration. So the applications are coming from application developers. You add them to the file system. You measure again, boot time, memory usage, contest switch system responsiveness. You delay other services that might be needed to delay, to change process priority, measure, measure the frame rate and resolution, run intensive benchmark again, fix regression, patch, 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 update SDK, OS image, and you're done. Are we done? No, we're not. Because yeah, the only thing that we'd done was to move very quickly from infatuations to dating after a couple of weeks, committing to production. And given the time stress and pressure, we just decided to work our way and power through. 
and we haven't followed any of the approaches that are best practices to make sure that this is production grade software and can be maintained later on, right? And this is where the disillusion main phase, uh, disillusion main phase um, stage kick in, right? Because you got to pay your taxes, as they say. Uh, and in open source, I think, and in the software engineering, there's a nice term uh, that back at Intel we used to call uh, the backpack. The backpack gets heavy. And by backpack, I mean the amount of code that has diverged from mainstream, whether because you just stayed divergent for too long or because you started combining things together, right? Uh, the reality is that as this backpack gets uh, fuller, it gets heavier, and the heavier it gets, right, the slower you are, right? You want to uh, uh, travel uh, light if you want to go far and fast, and that's not the case. And so uh, in software engineering, and in particular when it comes to open source and leveraging software that we haven't built in first place, Managing the technical debt, it's something that we want to do since the first kiss, right? That's very important, right? And you probably realize this is the second time around, a third time is around. All right, so the longer the separation lasts, uh, the higher the cost of ownership. And cost of ownership is a financial measure that you can measure um, the benefit of using any kind of software or technology. Um, uh, so tag and branch might be necessary. Uh, but it's better if it's done closer to product shipment. And it is usually a trade-off between small increments of infield upgrades uh, or full upgrades. So at some point, you're going to have to follow mainstream until it's ready to ship. But then once you've shipped it, you have to track with updates because that, that code base is frozen until the cost of providing updates infield becomes higher than the cost of doing a full upgrade. And, and it's not rocket science, but as, you know, as soon as you are aware of that problem, then you start thinking about how do I plan for that in the future? How do I plan so that the technical debt is kept as, as small as possible? You're going to have it, right? It's going to be lumpy, right? But you don't want that to explode. You want to take it down when it's time, and then it's going to back up, and then you want to take it down, keep it contained. If you think about Yalta Project and the concept of a layer, make sure that that layer is as thin as possible for as long as possible. Right, so, and there's a, I think a, a major uh, uh, mismatch of expectations, and we'll see that in the next phase, right? But open source is a train that keeps on chugging. Open source is about enabling innovation. Uh, uh, so new features and bug fixes and security fixes, they are always against latest. They're never against something that happened before. So the moment that you've frozen your code base, it is your own responsibility that to readapt, and that goes back to the technical debt. Um, so the same applies to CVEs and licensing information as well. Licensing information changes as packages are re-revved. The license associated to each package might change. Then the licensing information contained in the SPDX file that Phosology gives you as a hint will change. So the moment that, you know, consider all that, so when somebody comes to you and asks you for your SBOM, right, this is how you feel. Like, okay, well, now I need to produce this SBOM. Who knows about this SBOM? What's the software bomb? And where do I find all licensing information for all of this Frankenstein of software that I've built and put together without, you know, considering, uh, you know, my backpack? Right, thankfully, after all this, if you haven't quit yet, and none of us has, otherwise the author project and Zephyr wouldn't be here today, right? there's this stability phase. And I think the stability phase comes from the struggles and the disillusionment. Like during the struggle and the disillusionment, we realize that there's a mismatch between open source and production grade. Open source is not built for production grade. And it's a trade-off, and it's our responsibility. right? Initially, it was saying that Linaro has two souls, that of building open source ecosystem and the other, the proliferation of open sourcing products, that's what I do every day, and it's a compromise. So open source is about speed, right? It is tuned for speed. Products are tuned for stability. They are tuned for the least amount of changes possible 
that I need to do to have the greatest ROI possible. So the issue, and it's true for open source as well as any relationship in life, is that the fast progress that we make during the initial uh, stages of infatuations and dating uh, provides a false sense of readiness. We feel like it's ready, but it's not ready. The only objective of a Yachta project and in Zephyr is that to build reference images that gets you through system on chip selection as soon as possible. I'm going to use this SOC or that SOC and it works out of the box. It's a reference. It is ages from the final product. But yet, you go fast, and that gives you a false sense of readiness and stability, which is not there because your product is not going to be a reference platform. Reference platforms are not product. Nobody ships a Qualcomm RB5 reference platform. Else, all products would be similar, right? So I think stability phases where these two worlds are identified as different, and a compromise is identified and then the commitment to invest in bridging these two worlds is there, right? So it's a commitment about finding the perfect balance, right? And that's why I picked the seesaw, right? Clearly, uh, when we started this journey, everything was toward readiness, but now we're in the production world, so commitment. Right? And these are just some of the recommendations. There's many more things that can be done. Again, this is based on my experience. So number one, uh, I think it's important to know your ingredients and supply chain. Right? And back in the days, uh, when we kicked off the auto project, uh, but also in general, every day when we build products, uh, we use the analogy that each open source component that you decide to bring into the mix is like an M&A, a merchant acquisition. There's nothing different. It's not your technology, it's not your company, it's somebody, something that somebody else has built. So you don't acquire a company, but you source technology that you haven't designed, right? So for, all, for each critical component that you're going to be acquiring, identify alternatives, if alternatives exist. Assess and rate. I know this might be boring, but what if all of a sudden you haven't looked at the options and that specific critical component ceases to exist or ceases to be maintained? Now you're going to be the only one maintaining that. The entire cost of ownership is going to be on you. So assess and rate technical viability of options, community and industry support, broader community and broader community uh, industry support is clearly, you know, gives you clearly higher rates. And then assess the maturity past and future based on participations as investments. And there's websites that can help you with that, like uh, OpenHub, formerly known as Olo.net. I've used that a lot. Right? You can just assess, based on the code base, contributions, activity, and I think there's Project Chaos that does the same. I think there's a session about that at this conference too. But there's tools available today that inspect Git and Git history and Git logs that tells you how a project is active, how many maintainers you have. The more maintainers, the better, right? And then how frequent the updates are provided, right? And that kind of gives you an, uh, an idea of the viability from a technical standpoint and industry backing of the project. Prefer open source project to have an open governance uh, associated to that. It's great to have software and put it out there on the internet with an open source uh, license. But if there's no open governance and industry backing soon enough, you know, it's just a web page and a bit of code. And if something is critical for your product, best if there's other industry players to support that. You're not the only one who had that idea. And if you guys have read the Cathedral and the Bazaar, if you're the only one who had an idea, probably that idea is either stupid or you become billionaire. But chances are none of us is billionaires, so we tend to uh, follow uh, the solutions that somebody else has found for us, even if that means adapting right, the problem definition. Uh, track and know how to pivot. When do I switch from a project, uh, component that was critical but is not, not mature any enough, doesn't have industry backing to another one? Or maybe there is a licensing indication that a component has to be flagged because it's risky. Where do I pivot? Where's my alternative? It goes back to the identifying the alternatives. And then have a roadmap. Right? Your product roadmap, product software roadmap has to 
incorporate the release cadence of all the open source projects and components that you have included and sourced into your final image. Because if you don't have an idea of when does project, the other project release, when does component A release, component B releases, that you're not going to be able to match their release cadence with your product release cadence. You're always going to be fighting time as opposed to planning. Okay? That's my first recommendation. Second recommendation, invest in infrastructure. As you power through the dating phase, you haven't built in, in, in this illustration any infrastructure. Everything was pretty much relying on you. But the moment that you start tracking open source projects, it is very important to have an infrastructure that track repositories that you're pulling and, and, and management of those repositories, an infrastructure that allows you to uh, have different branching strategies, uh, allows you to review contributions as they come in and manage those contributions. GitLab, GitHub are perfect, right? They do this uh, and, 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 and spend time. Uh, spend time to make sure that you build auto builders and sanity checks and sanity checks is against the definition of quality and sanity that you and only you can define. So define a policy. Whether is that an IP policy, whether is that a quality policy, whatever policy you have, you had to build auto builders and sanity checks before you merge a PR that enforce that policy. Otherwise, it's going to be chaos. And then you had to make sure that people know that policy within your group and they're trained because if they don't know, not aware, and they're not trained, what you're doing here is gating development. You're gating innovation by enforcing the policy. So agree on that policy, but then enforce it. That's the definition of quality and auditing. Uh, invest in an infrastructure that allows you uh, to have remote devices and sharing and testing. Hardware is always, always lacking. So as opposed to hope uh, or demand the hardware group to have a gazillion targets, which they will not give you, just invest in an infrastructure that allows you to have a, hard, a harder target hooked up and available for everybody in the world to just borrow when they had to do testing and have automated testing, just booting up, powering up, testing hardware, and then booting them down, right? It's a worth investment. And that infrastructure should be generating artifacts for you, whether those are CVEs reports, quality reports, a benchmark performance test, compliance reports, whatever is your standard and then staff it, right? So you can't do this unless you staff an infrastructure. And remember at Huawei, uh, we wanted to build the infrastructure, but we did struggle because we, we not, not I, but there was this false idea that a developer can also be somebody who writes documentation. It can also be somebody who just, right? No, you build an infrastructure, just get a DevOps engineer. Maybe two. You don't need much, but you need somebody who's dedicated, undivided attention is toward the infrastructure if it's a critical component. Same for documentation. There's no things as fractional engineering. If I'm a kernel developer, I am a kernel developer. I can't do doc and test cases and infrastructure at the same time, right? It's just nonsense. It never works. You end up having great kernel drivers and no documentation, no infrastructure, because then people tend to choose what they like better. Right. And don't put a kernel engineers to become a documentation guy. They don't like it. Right? Okay, third, design for compliance. Design for usability, uh, test-driven development, usability-driven development. I think we're in the world of compliance-driven development. And when I say com compliance, I mean really vulnerability, licensing, or standards. Right? Have those in mind as you design your infrastructure, your roadmap, the uh, components you're going to be tracking from open source, and so forth. Uh, identify the industry standards that uh, belong to your definition of compliance. Build software bill of material incrementally. Don't wait to the end of the project to build the first software bill of material and then pass it on to an IP auditor or even worse, Hope that what Fosology gives you is correct and complete and 100% uh, accurate because they're not, right? But just if you have an early cadence uh, for a release, do quarterly checkpoints and at every quarter, just establish different uh, um, coverage and, and, um, and completion uh, of the software bomb. For instance, by first quarter, I want to have 25% of the bomb done by second quarter 50%, by third quarter 75%, and then establish quality criteria as well. 
by the third quarter, I only had to have five defects, 10 defects, meaning, you know, IP flight issues from compliance. Same is true for CVEs and such. Establish incremental coverage, right, and qualitative goals. Um, make compliance gating contributions. If you're serious about that, it's about policy, right? Make an IP compliance or a CVE compliance policy gating a PR. Right, so if I check some code in and then the policy, uh, which is implemented by the automatic tool chain that triggers Phosology, gives me an incompatible license, that contribution is gated. Again, developers don't like that, but that's the only way that you're gonna be enforcing a policy and, and make sure that they're serious about that, right? Train them and make an IP auditor available to the entire development team. Because without an IP auditor or a group of lawyers to ask questions such as, hey, how about that license? How about that license? Are they compatible? Everything is gonna happen at the end, right? And lawyers cost by the hour, a lot of money, right? And inefficiencies are something that you can't afford. Hire, just like the infrastructure, an IP auditor at least, and maybe somebody, a lawyer who's uh, IP and open source friendly as well. You don't have to use those uh, all the time. The IP auditor do, does most of the work, but having a lawyer which is available to the development team, not only increases their visibility of the whole picture as opposed to just their kernel driver, uh, but it's also very useful because it addresses problems as soon as possible. And maintain a healthy level of technical debt. Uh, it's my fourth recommendation. So upstream, upstream, upstream. Neil was here before talking about upstreaming, the strategy for upstreaming. Uh, at Linaro, upstream is part of the value but it can't suck 100% of the time, otherwise you don't do roadmap development. Best is figure out what is a good amount of time that each developer can dedicate to upstream. 20%, 25%, that's the worst case scenario. Allow for that when you do spring planning. All right, Neil, 25% this sprint, 20%, 15%, what do you think it's gonna happen? Oh no, I think 10% is enough this sprint, great. But bake upstreaming into the capacity available because otherwise it's gonna be an afterthought. And what you're gonna you know, find that happens is that at the end of the sprint, one developer only closed 10% of their points because they spent all the time upstreaming and that was not foreseen. And it's absolutely something that one can plan. So make it a high priority task uh, during spring planning and make it a release criteria. If you need to manage technical debt, you can decide that before you release your product and software for your product, 80% of the changes that you've made, that made into that layer, they have to be contributed upstream. It can be 70, it can be 60, it can be 1%, so long as it is a release criteria item, uh, the gates that release, right? Because only if you make it a release gating criteria, you're serious about managing your technical debt. Otherwise, it's going to be wishy-washy. Yeah, I know that I need to manage my technical debt, but I never have time to do so, right? And then participate and influence, right? Remember that? Who's that handsome guy to the right side of the picture? <laughs> this is Barcelona, 1925. <laughs> yes. See me? So drive and predict it's better than follow and adjust. If you're using critical components in your production software, don't just let others drive their technical roadmap. Participate, be one of those industry big, big backer that, backer, backer that belong and participate to the project, right? It, it's just like being electing a representative to the government without checking and monitoring what they do, right? And then you can complain that the country goes in the direction where you don't want it to go, right? So the same is here. So if you use something which is critical to you, make sure that you can influence the direction. Contribute my time and money uh, to open governance. It's not just about contributing and working with the technical community, but it's also about advisory boards and uh, different committees. Again, you can complain if all of a sudden the author project decides to abandon GCC for LLVM, right? And you just didn't know about that. And then you had to change your release plan if you don't participate and influence that choice. And keep yourself informed, like being at this conference and seek advice. And from now on, you can call me, right? I can help you with your relationship, uh, open source law relationship if you want, but there's plenty of companies and 
individuals that can help you. So hopefully, if you follow this advice, and there's many more, this is just like the top ones. Uh, Phil, can you think of, anybody can think of any other advice? Or did I touch the most important ones? Yeah. And hopefully we get to the bliss phase. Remember, we had the seesaw completely unbalanced before, right? It's always a balancing act. Remember, remember tune for speed, tune for stability, right? It's a balancing act. And you go right and you go left. And, but so long as you just you don't fall, I think you're good and predict the trajectory. With that said, I want to leave some time for questions, uh, five minutes to the end. Um, I will invite you to Linaro Connect. That's going to happen May 14th, 17th in Madrid. If you're interested, registration is still open. You can just point your camera to the QR code. I'm going to leave this up here for 30 seconds. And then you can come and meet us at fifth floor, me and the Linaro crew at the Linaro booth. If you have any questions uh, from this talk or any of the other talks that my Linaro uh, friends uh, have given uh, during this conference. And with that, questions. It's, so OpenHub is not mend. <clears throat> it is just the analysis of Git repos. And so I don't know if you ever added a project, and I think I've done a couple of times once you add a project there. Uh, and what I'm trying to say is just don't take everything that you see for granted. What was the other one? Uh, chaos, C-H-A-O-S-S, -S, I think. It doesn't have a repository like OpenHub built on Git repository that you submit in project that you claim. But it's got a set of tools in the dashboard for you to be able to at least measure your own uh, software stack, right? And there's plenty of tools out there, uh, contributions and such. It's all about productivity. We're talking about production-grade software. So what we measure, we can fix. What we can't measure, we can do anything about that. Did you guys get the question, right? Okay. Other questions? No more questions? I'm curious, like, what, what do you think the, when you're kind of communicating this stuff upstream to, like, upper management, like, who, for, like, a business that's very concerned about the bottom line and, and direct value of the customer, what, what's the argument for you to really get them to buy in on, like, the things you talked about today as far as, um, like, investing in infrastructure, um, making upstream contributions, things like that, that, from their perspective, is just getting in the way of product development for the customer? Yeah, so... It's always, it's always a compromise and a trade-off. And I did use the uh, analogy with an M&A emergent acquisition, right? And it's something that um, management usually understand. If you are merging two companies or two technologies and you're just bringing on board technology that you don't know, you haven't built, you haven't designed, right? You're not going to get rid of all the people <laughs> who have built it because otherwise you're going to be in trouble. So if you, want, if you want to go with that analogy, if you're insourcing technologies that you haven't built from open source community, right, you're not going to be onboarding those people. Those people are out there. And the only way to communicate with them, right, and to reduce the technical debt is that to make sure that what you change is accepted by that and that maintained by them so that you can always transfer the cost of ownership and cost of maintenance to uh, the mainstream of a project. Right, so that's the analogy that you can go with. And then, but the best thing is just math, right? Just go linear, right? So the amount of line of codes that stays with me and the company, if I don't upstream, which is branched off, is gonna grow over time and increase over time. And then there's just software engineering metrics out there that tells you how many bugs and what is the cost of maintenance per lines of code or tens line of code or a thousand lines of code. So that analogy of just keeping that layer, that technical, that, that backpack as thin as light as possible plays into that. 
it's a compromise, right? Okay, well, you can keep it growing forever, and then in five years, the cost may be unbearable, or you can just keep it going for one year or two years. It doesn't get in the way of just product launch, but then you might just decide that it's time to reset, flush it out, and then restart, right? And, and then the cost of, and then if you go with that analogy, you could say, well, then but why do I have to wait two years when I could just invest 15% of the bandwidth or 10% of the bandwidth of somebody to just work on infrastructure and constant tracking? I don't have to wait those two years and stop production because all I have to do for two months is upstream, which is something which is out of your control because, you know, upstream requires somebody else to accept in your changes. So, you know, usually math helps. Just my advice is don't keep it like, oh, it's common sense. Duh, because it just doesn't work well. It's just like, hey, have you thought about this? And how about I build a simulator and tells you what is the cost if we do this versus this versus that? Sounds good. Yes, this is the part where, and this is not science, like there is a bit of gut as well. It's just like, do I invest in this company or other company? How's that project going? And that's where keep yourself informed come into play. But, and it's harder for a tool chain, like what alternative is there, you know, to GCC, right? Well, there's alternatives, but 10 years ago, what alternative is there? So sometimes you have your back against the wall, against the wall. Some other times, whenever you can, just find alternatives. Exactly. You're, you're not responsible for those. They just happen to. Yes. Yeah, but people have a hard time accepting that what they made was a good decision, but now they have to redo it. Yeah. So that kind of technical debt grows over time, but people are not very good at reducing it. Yeah. So it just it happens, right? It's, it's, I would say that it's the technical debt that doesn't depend from what you do right? It's probably more rare than the technical debt that you create yourself. So I think probably the best approach would be try to minimize your technical debt and be aware that at some point something might happen that wasn't due to your decisions that might lead to a, a technical debt uh, reduction scramble. It requires a lot of education, and, and especially with upper management. All right, I think time's up. Thank you for attending, guys. And again, uh, register to Linaro uh, Connect and come visit us at the booth and enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>